morning, everyone. This morning's reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13. The armour of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. This is the word of the Lord. As we come to the message of God, will you pray with me? Father God, be present with us and surround us with the knowledge of your love. Jesus Christ, word of God, speak your truth through me so that my words might be not mine but yours. Spirit of God, move our hearts to accept your teaching and be changed, moulded into your new creation. Amen. When I was a child, I played a lot of video games. I think growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, it was just the perfect time to grow up with video games. They were just starting to get seriously popular around that time. All of the kids had a PlayStation, were playing Crash Bandicoot or Mario. And it was also before the days of smartphones and social media and things like that. So we still had to find other ways to fill in our time. And for my generation, video games was just just a very big part of that. So I and my brother and sister, we played a lot of games, both separately and together. Crash Bandicoot, I mentioned, is one we all loved, and similar adventure games like Ratchet and Clank. One of my sister's favourite was Mary Kate and Ashley, and my brother played Diablo a lot. And if you don't recognise all of those, that's fine. Like I said... <laughs> I think it was just a weird thing with people around my age. We just love our video games. One thing that might surprise you a lot is that I was very much into war games. Games where you'd command an army to defeat an opposing power. And one of my favourite games, I would spend hours on this one actually, was an old computer game called Age of Empires. If you're not familiar with Age of Empires, I'll briefly give an idea of the game. It was sort of a mix between a war game and a civilization building game. You'd take control of an ancient society like the Greeks or Egyptians or Romans. You'd start out as, you know, Stone Age hunter-gatherer types, potentially just one or two people, and you'd build different kinds of buildings, acquire resources like food, wood and stone, research new abilities and technologies. Also, you could progress through history and become more advanced. And through that, you'd get more skilled in warfare. You'd get better things like chariots and warships so that you could defend yourself against attack and conquer your neighbours. And there was these whole campaigns based on real historical events and you'd have to strategise your way through them all. And that's why I enjoyed the thinking, the strategy part of it. What was the best way to achieve victory? The funny thing is, I mentioned these historical campaigns based on the ancient histories of nations like Egypt and Greece. You could also, in the game, design your own campaigns. Like you'd create your own maps with land and sea, you'd put all your people and enemies in place, set the scenario and what you needed to do to win, and then you'd play it through. And so me, all of, I must have been about 10 years old or something, I had the bright idea to design a campaign in Age of Empires based on Bible stories. <laughs> now that may seem weird at first, but at that age I knew my Bible, I loved reading stories, and I knew plenty of stories, especially from the Old Testament, where there were battles and wars, and so I had plenty to draw on. Things like Moses and the Israelites escaping Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. Joshua entering the Promised Land, the walls of Jericho. 
David and Goliath. I don't even remember half of what I did, really. (laughs) But the very last level of the campaign I made, I remember that pretty well. It was supposed to represent the final battle, Revelation, the Apocalypse. And in my 10-year-old mind, I sort of envisioned that as a massive free-for-all. Horses and chariots and swordsmen and siege machines and navies, good versus evil, battling it out once and for all to decide who would win. This was a child's idea of what spiritual warfare looked like. Spiritual warfare is one of those Christianese phrases where if you grew up in a church, you probably heard it many times. But if you're just visiting or if you don't have much of a Christian background, you'll probably be thinking, what on earth is he talking about? And if that's you, then don't worry, you've come to the right place. That's exactly what we're going to talk about today. But even if you're familiar with spiritual warfare, even if you know perfectly well what it means, even if you've done it yourself, it's still worth talking about and being reminded of what it really is. Remember that the evil one is a liar and a deceiver and a trick he'll use is to fool us into thinking we already know everything, that we have it all together. That's when we're in the most danger. And if we need reminding of the fundamentals of spiritual warfare, then this part of Paul's letter to the Ephesians is probably the clearest statement we're going to get. We're now coming towards the end of our series on Ephesians. Chapter 6 is the last chapter. And to recap the overarching story, we heard in the first part of Paul's letter to this church, a mixture of Gentile and Jewish believers in Jesus Christ, that God has blessed them with every spiritual blessing. He's united the two formerly hostile groups into one new humanity through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then this latter part of the book, Paul gets into what this means practically for their lives and things like personal conduct, marriage and family life. And these are not separate from God or the Gospel. God is very much involved in the Ephesians' daily lives and in our daily lives. And then finally, as a conclusion to all this, Paul talks about warfare. Fighting, struggling, cheerful, isn't it? Putting on the full armour of God. Many of us will be familiar with the passage about the full armour of God from Sunday school, you might be able to recite it from memory, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness and so forth. You'll notice that wasn't part of the reading we did today because we'll be getting into those details next week. But before we do that, before we get into what the full armour of God is, we need to talk about why we need it in the first place. See, you wouldn't just wear armour just any old day, would you? Even if you were expecting trouble and taking precautions, you wouldn't go that far. You only wear armour if you're in a full-blown, fair dinkum, life-or-death war. And if we're in a war, we need to know some things, don't we? We need to know what kind of battle we're in, what we're supposed to be doing, what our role is. And in particular, we'll look at this passage through the lens of three questions, which would be important questions in any war, whether it's real life or a video game. Firstly, who is our enemy? Second, what is our strategy? And third, what is our victory? Who's our enemy? What's our strategy? What's our victory? So firstly, there's a question of who is our enemy? And that's an important one, isn't it? Because we don't want to be fighting against the wrong thing or the wrong people. And that's the very point Paul was trying to make clear when he says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If it were easy to tell who our enemy is, then why would Paul need to say that at all? 
the fact that he needs to tell the Ephesians and tell them who is not the enemy must mean that it's very easy to get confused, very easy to go in the wrong direction, very easy to fight flesh and blood which does nothing to subdue the forces of evil that are the real problem. I mentioned the evil one before, and it might be very easy for you to believe in the devil or some sort of force of evil. Or it might not be so easy. Today's culture treats the devil as a bit of a joke. You know, red, horns and a tail, a pitchfork... That's not how the Bible describes the devil, by the way, though that's beside the point. The reality is that when we look at the world around us, we have to believe the devil exists. It's obvious. Nothing else explains the evil we see in the world. It's why we do prayers of intercession every Sunday. From wars and genocide and horrific crimes to illness and suffering and death that has no good explanation. In a world where there's so much good and joy, what could drive a man to murder millions of people? How do we explain a disease that slowly dehumanises and painfully kills? How do we justify that there are so many people that don't have food or shelter Evil exists, we all know that, and it must have a source. What the danger is, the danger Paul warns against, is that we see evil and are rightly angered by the evil, but then in our anger we end up fighting the appearance of evil, not the source. We hold people, flesh and blood, responsible for the devil's work. Now, make no mistake, people must be held to account for what they do wrong in this world. It's good and right to do that. We are to love justice. But that's what the law of the land is for. That's what the authorities are for. Paul talks about that in one of his other letters. And if the authorities aren't doing their job properly, then God will judge them. But our struggle is not against flesh and blood. People are not the enemy. Our enemy is the devil and the powers of evil in heaven and on earth. No one more, no one less. So that's our enemy. The second question then, what is our strategy? When I played that game Age of Empires as a kid, it was actually quite a hard game. If you didn't develop your civilization fast enough or if you were unprepared or if you had the wrong sorts of fighters for the situation, you could just get overwhelmed and wiped out. It wasn't enough to just fight your hardest. You needed to know what you were doing. You needed a strategy. So what's our strategy then? How do we fight to win this war? We can see this by what Paul tells the Ephesians to do. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then he says, not once but twice, put on the full armour of God. Put on the full armour of God. What's this telling us? What's the common factor here? It's God, isn't it? Be strong in the Lord. Put on the full armour of God. You could play a game. This has come up a lot in our men's Bible study as we've gone through the book of Ephesians. You can try and count up how many times Paul uses a phrasing in Christ or in the Spirit or in him. He says it so many times and in very important places. He tells the Ephesians they have every spiritual blessing in Christ that God has seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, that he created in himself one new humanity out of the two. I could go on, but I'm sure you're getting the picture. Every good thing God has done for us, every blessing, our salvation, bringing us back to him, reconciling us, all of that was done in himself. 
by his own power and action. So why would spiritual warfare be any different? Why would God leave us alone to face the powers of evil in this dark world in our own strength? Why would we even want to try to do this? As Ricard said earlier, if we're standing alone, we're not going to do much good. And this fight is not us swinging swords and trying to crush the enemy. Nowhere in the passage does Paul say anything like that. He just says, be strong, stand firm, put on the armour of God. Trust in his power, not our own. Because just like in Christ God gave us all blessings and overcame every obstacle separating us from him, so in Christ, and I just lost my page. <laughs> so in Christ, God will overcome the forces of evil and bring victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. So our strategy is simply to remain in him. Remain in him. So we know our enemy and our strategy. Last question, what is our victory? If we're doing spiritual warfare, if we're in a war, what does victory look like? What's our objective? How do we know when we've won the war? If we think of that in real life, it's not always a simple question, is it? Wars end when one or both sides can't fight anymore, but there could be many reasons for that. In this case, though, we know exactly what victory looks like just by looking a little further in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. In chapter 20, the writer John describes how Satan, or the devil, gathers the nations for battle in numbers like the sand on the seashore, From verse 9, they marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. And then fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Blink and you miss it. It's over that quickly. You remember what I thought Armageddon would be like as a kid playing video games, all these people fighting? I'm guessing I must not have made to that point in the Bible by that point. But in the end, victory is not only assured, God does it without breaking a sweat. His people, those in his city, nothing even touches them. If we go back to Ephesians again, that's why Paul talks about standing over and over again. Not fighting, not winning, nothing like that. Simply standing. Put on the full armour of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand and watch what God does. Stand and rejoice in him. He brings salvation. He defeats the enemy. He is our victory. As I was talking about earlier, spiritual warfare is one of those phrases very linked with church and not really used outside of it. But even for people who've been believers for a long time, it can sometimes carry a connotation that isn't necessarily true. Things like praying for miraculous healing or God's intervention in a situation or even the casting out of demons. And make no mistake, that's a part of spiritual warfare. It happens in the Bible. But if we think spiritual warfare is only about that, then we'll start to think it's only for certain people with a certain level of holiness and certain God-given gifts. And that is not the case. Paul isn't writing this letter to a special group, to particular holy people. He's telling all of the Ephesians 
to be strong in the Lord, to put on the whole armour of God. He's saying, you're in a war, this is how you fight it, all of you. And we too ought to get the same message. We are all in a war, constantly, even the seemingly quiet, dull moments when nothing is happening. Evil is always at work in the world. Like I said earlier, we see it. We feel it. But we have nothing to fear. The outcome is decided and it does not depend on us. We don't have to be a super spiritual prayer warrior. We don't even need to have that much faith at all. All we need to do is know our enemy, not flesh and blood, but spiritual forces of evil. We must follow our strategy, remain in Christ, remember what he's done. I was thinking as I prayed before the sermon that we all live under the cross. We all live under what Jesus did for us. He came, he died, he rose, he ascended. What remains for us is to be strong and assured in his power. And then we will see our victory. Even when all looks hopeless, even when evil surrounds us everywhere, it will be over in the blink of an eye. God will win. God has won. So take heart, people of God, and stand firm. Amen.